So hello, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome Svetlana Heger, Paul Petrich, Olaf Nikolai, who are our contributors and panelists today. And uh, there will be two more contributions from Pavel Steretz and Yuri Kovanda. Uh, hopefully, they will join us uh, later, uh, later in the afternoon. This is the last session of the uh, symposium forming the reformed and uh, I know that uh, it's not easy to uh, to contemplate about our teaching uh, right in the middle of uh, urgencies and frustrations that are that we are living in in particular uh, in relation with with uh, covid quarantine uh, this thought brings me the, or uh, this thought was bring by by today meeting that we have uh, we have a collective meeting with all uh, pedagogical staff at AWO at the Fine Arts Academy in Prague and uh, I have to say that uh, actually what what we were discussing and trying to solve it's more like emergency call that the second year actually of uh, studies is uh, interrupted by the by the COVID uh, situation and uh, we didn't have really uh, time to to talk about uh, ideal situation but rather uh, rather uh, try to answer uh, really immediate uh, immediate urgencies related with the, with the final diploma works or with the first uh, grade students still i think that uh, throughout uh, the symposium we get in, into the core what our teaching could be or what what our teaching is for for some individuals and we had a great variety of contributions from from the whole planet and also from various kinds of institution and i i hope i think that actually these experiences also collective experiences not only individual but also collective uh, contributions could be the best inspiration and certain move actually uh, that, that is that that is helpful. That is uh, a kind of tool of possibilities uh, in the times uh, in the times of crisis. Uh, last thing, maybe uh, this symposium is uh, slowly moving from uh, actually live mode into the archival mode, uh, meaning that uh, still we are uh, we are broadcasting live today, but all the contributions will be moved to uh, in, in February will be moved to uh, a web page of uh, Fine Arts Academy in Prague and will be available uh, archival uh, as, as online archival uh, source of materials. There will be also a small text edit, but for us actually uh, it will not end up here, but we are thinking and we are decide we decided that uh, we would like to continue one way or another we don't know how exactly we will hope that we can invite you to prague and that we can meet physically during sometime during next year hopefully and uh, <coughs> so so uh, even after this session this effort uh, this reflection about our dedication is not over so now I will start with the with the uh, introduction of the first contribution of Paul Petrich uh, Paul Petrich uh, was uh, born in 1968 in, in the city of Friesach in Austria. Since 2014, he is head of the department site-specific art at the University of uh, Applied, Applied Arts, uh, the Angewandte. And uh, since 2015, he's member of the panel of uh, Kunzale Exnergasse, uh, the exhibition space in uh, Kunzale Exnergasse. He's as artist, he's active and he works in collaboration with Nicole Six since uh, 1997. Nicole Six and Paul Petrich have been realizing films, photographs, displays, artist books, as well as site and context specific installations and projects in public space since 1997. They live in Vienna. They explore the limits of our existence and our perception with expeditions into the everyday life through oceans, polar regions, concrete deserts, as well as lunar landscapes. With their experimental test arrangements and interventions, they locate themselves and the viewer again and again in art spaces, architectures and landscapes. So please, uh, let's play the first contribution from Paul Petrich.
Hello students, guests and colleagues. I'm part of the artist duo Nicole Six and Paul Petrich. Since 1997, we have been making films and artist books, taking photographs, presenting displays and context-specific installations and realizing projects in public space. We live in Vienna. In my talk, I will discuss the most characteristic parts of our teaching program. I will start with a brief presentation of our curriculum and then using specific examples from a project with students. I will describe a possible outcome. At this point, I would like to thank Wiet Havranek and Thomas Schwanek for their invitation to participate in the symposium. I'm very glad to be part of this event. I work at the University of Applied Arts and am in charge of setting up and running the Department of Site-Specific Art, which is part of the Institute of Fine Arts and Media Art. Our neighbors and sister disciplines are the departments of Photography, Graphics, Painting, Painting and Animated Film and Sculpture and Space. From a historical perspective and with reference to the landscape and institutional critique, site-specific art has focused, above all, on outdoor space as a site of production and reception. One might say that the resistance, the opposition directed at an institutional framework, is already implemented here. With this in mind, the department is addressing these concepts in a discussion that is very topical today. We want to re-examine the classical work and presentation spaces of art, the studio, the gallery and the museum. This is the point of departure of our investigation. Our curriculum adheres the profile description of the Institute of Fine Arts, defines the goals, scope, structure, the admission exam, the division into the first and second study segments, the so-called main artistic subject, and the master thesis. To sum up the main points, the diploma program begins with the student passes the entrance exam. The main artistic subject, derived from the master class system, is the core of the study program. Completing individual artistic projects, working with text, attending individual meetings, group discussions and technically implementing projects or work in the studios and workshops foster the students' independence and autonomy. Furthermore, we expand the focus of our curriculum by offering opportunities to visit exhibitions, work on projects, go on excursions and attend guest lecturers together. Our department has studios, lecture halls, wood, metal, mold making and digital workshops. Our own in-house exhibition space gives passerby a glimpse into what we do and presents itself to the city. 
The space can be used for university as well as external projects. The main artistic subject is backed by lectures. It is divided into five main categories. Artistic and research practice, scientific and research practice, artistic practice in technical context, economic and organizatorial practice, and free electives. Now that I have given an overview of our study program, I would like to briefly describe a very specific project, the Walk Around Vienna, the Umrundung von Wien. Our city, the city in which we live and work and study, will be the point of departure and focus of the project. We will circumnavigate it on foot. The Walk Around Vienna will take an entire work week. Our average walking speed might be five kilometers per hour. At the same time, however, due to the Earth's rotation, we will cover a distance of 1,670 kilometers per hour. 107,208 kilometers due to the Earth revolving around the Sun and 960,000 kilometers due to the sun revolving around the center of the galaxy. Examination modus, the group stays together. Our idea was that teaching is always influenced by hierarchy and other institutional conditions. And this in turn has to do with budget, equipment, exhibition space and audience. These constraints in conjunction with the lesson have always bothered us. With this project we seek to counteract these factors. We step outside, we start walking. We experience our own city in a new way, not in an everyday sense, but away from a daily work, away from a social network. We need no budget, no workshops, no exhibition space, no audience. We walk as individuals, as a group, as artists. I sent the symposium organizers my proposal to speak about the walk around Vienna and Wied wrote back the following. Dear Paul, thank you very much. Your proposal fits very well within the symposium scope. One remark. If you could develop it in one direction, it would be great. If such a project serves a key study as model for pedagogical activity, what kind of curricula it would generate? Do you think that art pedagogy could consist only from deep intellectual and physical interdisciplinary projects? Or do we still need teaching of classical matters? And what kind of new school organization experience of your project could generate? Even despite thinking about my subject for the symposium and Wied's email, I don't have a steadfast answer to these questions. My impression is that the curriculum can be a reference point and guideline. Artistic training, which is above all based on the development of resistance and 
specialization can at best follow these from time to time, but ultimately must run counter to it. While I'm writing these lines, I receive a message from a university. Due to the lockdown, the university building is closed and not being able to get into the studios, some of the students in our program have occupied an empty lot. They are currently living and working there. A university staff member asks me in her email if I am aware of this and who is legally responsible. Since I had no knowledge of the occupation of the empty lot, I am beginning to think the curriculum might be working. Paul, thank you for your contribution. Thank you, Vid, for the invitation. We got two practical answers how to deal with lockdown. First is to, to organize walk through the city. And uh, the second was to occupy an empty lot, right? Yes. I think we will have question answers after the all the contributions. Okay. And we will we will continue with, with uh, Svetlana Heger Davis, and uh, I will I will write uh, I will read a short uh, bio of uh, Svetlana, and uh, then we will have a live talk, which is a form that Svetlana chose. So Svetlana Heger Davis was born in in Czech Republic and grew up in Bregenz in Austria. She studied fine arts at the University of Applied Art in Vienna, where Paul Petrich is teaching now, and subsequently completed postgraduate studies at the Mas Ma Musa Shino Art University in Tokyo. After finishing her res residence in Japan, Svetlana Heger lived and worked in the USA, where she started her artistic career with a focus on conceptual art. For over 20 years, she has exhibited in numerous international museums, galleries, and institutions, such as Musée de Beaux-Arts Nancy, Le Consortium in Dijon, Wiener Secession, Melbourne Biennale, Berlin Biennale, Saint Georges Pompidou in Paris, Art Space in New York, Centre National de la Photographie in Paris, Moderna Musée in Stockholm, Hamburg Bahnhof, Manifesta 11. Zurich, Antarctic Pavilion, 57th Venice Biennale, etc. Her artistic works have been reviewed and published in Art Forum, Flash Art, Freeze, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Der Spiegel, and uh, also in Princeton University Press, La Presse du Réel, Edition Flammarion, Walter Koenig, and many other medias. In 2012, Svetlana Heger was appointed as a professor of fine arts at the Academy of Fine Arts at Umea University in Sweden, where she served as a prorector and rector from 2014 to 2017. From 2016 to 2017, she was a member of steering board of Kuno Network, a network of Scandinavian and Baltic art schools. In August 2017, Svetlana Heger was elected as the head of the Department of Fine Arts at the Zurich University of the Arts, ZHDK, and as one of the members of the University Leadership Group. 
Since 2018, she is also the chair of the Dossier International Relationships at ZHDK. So, welcome, Stefan. <laughs> My first question would relate to your uh, curriculum, actually, or to your CV. You studied at the academies and universities in Vienna, Tokyo. You studied also in New York. You taught at the universities in Sweden and now in Switzerland. Uh, when you look at uh, all these culturally and nationally different systems of art education, uh, what in particular you would recall or bring back while designing an ideal program of art education? Thank you very much. I would like to say thank you also to Miet and uh, Tomasz and Lucia for inviting me to take part in this conference. And um, yeah, also hello to all my colleagues from all over the world or who are participating and who are here today. Um, yeah, um, as maybe you mentioned my biography, uh, I grew up uh, in the former Czechoslovakia and maybe um, the curiosity and uh, the, the experience that I could not travel until I was 14 um, drove me uh, during and after my studies to go immediately somewhere else and experience different culture um, environments such as um, the USA or uh, Japan, which were kind of the furthest I could go at a time. <laughs> Um, and um, I would say it was a very important experience for my own artistic practice and also to, to me as a person, as a human being, um, to experience different cultural backgrounds, different um, diverse uh, environments. And um, as we know, we as artists always kind of are trying to solve some kind of a problem, which is a problem in a, in a kind of a positive way. Um, um, the connotation of it, but um, to also kind of start it a new life in a different um, city uh, with a different language um, where the production conditions and uh, the study conditions are completely different to the previous ones. Um, I kind of loved this kind of, um, you know, jumping into cold water and, and um, start something from, from a point zero. And um, I think even now, these are very important experiences for the students to, um, to try to get out of their comfort zone, to try to get out of their uh, um, you know, safe space within the art academy they, they used to. Um, and um, also to learn you know, how different people talk and work uh, within the arts. I mean, I remember, for example, these different experiences when, while I was studying in, in Vienna, it was not very common to really speak about your own art in front of a group. And sometimes we were forced, and I know we kind of dreaded these uh, group crits. <laughs> and, um, and also um, maybe at a time, because my German wasn't you know, to the perfection of the others, I was maybe also a little bit intimidated to present uh, something on a high intellectual level uh, in, a, in a foreign language to me at that time. Uh, we did had hardly any courses in English, so even my English was stronger at the time. I could not express my, um, uh, um, yeah, my, my. Um, I could not present my work in in in, in that language. Uh, but what I, for example, realized when I was in the States, people could talk very elaborate about their own work. But once they started to show the work, the works, the artistic productions were not as strong as maybe the presentations were. And so this is something I learned as well that sometimes, you know, people can blend you because they can talk a lot about their work, but once you see the work, it's not as strong as you thought it would be. And the other way around, maybe sometimes people who are rather shy and are not as um, um, extrovert, um, they can have very strong artistic practices. And so it, it is about encouragement um, on both sides, the people who maybe are rather introvert to, to kind of encourage them to, um, you know, be, be, be proud, proud and um, confident to speak about the work and vice versa, people maybe who are very strong in their rhetorics to kind of encourage them to maybe focus more on the artistic practice than on the presentation forms. And yeah, I think this kind of a way of curiosity, uh, the students have to, of course, bring when we um, interview them uh, for the admissions and um, kind of certain uh, willingness to adapt um, and be also spontaneous in certain situations. 
Um, I think this is something I brought with me from these kind of contexts. Uh, we yes, uh, could, maybe, maybe could you tell us something, a few words about uh, the history of, uh, of the Z ZHDK where you, you teach right now, and if there are some uh, specificities in, in Swiss educational system, uh, you mentioned two of them when we were preparing the talk, one was the dual system, and the second, what, what was really curious to me, was average age of your students. That is uh, relatively high comparing to, to other students, which is 37 years. In, there are some really uh, really matured all, older students that uh, I think uh, usually that are usually uh, used to meet at the art schools. Mm -hmm. Um, so the Zurich University of the Arts has a quite long tradition, it's around 150 years old, but was not uh, shaped in this uh, organization as it is now. It used to be um, up to the 90s, a kind of, of vocational school as any other kind of skill oriented uh, uh, edu higher education uh, in Switzerland. Um, I don't know, maybe if you know the Swiss system, uh, you know that um, the vocational training is on a very high level, like the service is extremely, um, has a very high standard. People are extremely uh, um, uh, trained to, to serve uh, in the public or in the stores. And so the art education at the time up to the 1990s or 1995 was considered as a kind of a preparation for uh, practical for the for the practical world it was not considered as a university education um, nevertheless um, since um, there were music schools art schools um, design schools started to come out uh, again um, in the 90s as well um, out of the architecture schools um, and um, also film and um, acting schools uh, started to be more present and more popular among the younger generation. Um, there was the idea to um, change the system into a university system. And in um, 2012, all these different departments and different disciplines uh, fused into one big school, the Zurich University of the Arts. And um, the situation we have now, we have five big departments, the fine art department, design department, art education and culture analysis department, um, theater, drama, uh, film and dance is one department and we have a very big music department. Um, and um, maybe particular uh, for the um, dual system uh, you mentioned, Veet, is that in Switzerland, um, the students who come from um, so-called vocational training, Lehre, can also apply for the higher education in Switzerland and can be admitted as um, on the same level as somebody who comes from a gymnasium with a high school degree. So we have a quite balanced um, study body of students who came from vocational trainings uh, on the bachelor level as uh, students who came from a gymnasium. And uh, for example, the design department requests one year practical work before the students apply for the, for the university education. So it's very much still kind of based on this kind of a practical idea. Nevertheless, the fine arts department, I would say is maybe the most advanced one because we dissolve all the disciplines. We don't have any um, master classes which are focused on one professor or one professor's practice uh, or one discipline. Um, all the groups we have are fine arts, are diverse, um, so you can imagine it's kind of like a, um, every, every group is like a, like a music band, you have different players uh, with different disciplines and they somehow work together, which I think is quite a nice and contemporary idea and I see lots of advantages in that that we um, still have these big names teaching with us, um, but uh, they are not like the, um, the only role model on the, on the, in the first row. It's, we, we also do co-teaching, so that means uh, there are always two uh, professors uh, uh, running one group. Um, and um, 
they can also come from different disciplines. So we could have Maria Eichhorn teaching together with Nora Turato, for example. Um, so these are quite wide combinations, but uh, they appeal um, and, um, to the students. And um, I also like this kind of mixing of different generations together because sometimes, um, you know, the younger generation is completely different idea to the older generation, but when they mix, there is a quite good uh, outcome for the students um, uh, who are usually younger. On the BA level, we have very young students, like I think on as on in all the other schools, but on the MA level, what you mentioned, um, it is qu uh, quite a phenomenon, which I was quite um, shocked in the beginning when I arrived in Zurich, uh, to realize that the students on the master level are on average 37 years old. Sometimes they are older than the teachers. <laughs> and um, that has to do with um, also kind of um, maybe a different situation in Switzerland that lots of the people when they finish the BA is uh, already kind of considered as a degree where you can apply for different uh, stipends and residencies and uh, state support and so on. So people don't necessarily go into the master anymore. And if they decide to go into the master, they usually have already an artistic career in between. And then maybe when they older, they decide, oh, maybe I would like to teach. And if I have a master, I earn more money. Um, so then they decide to come into the MA. And that is maybe a different to the other countries. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not always consecutive. We try to kind of also, you know, encourage uh, students from the BA, uh, to apply immediately after they finish the BA, the, the MA, if they don't know what to do exactly after their studies. Of course, we encourage them also to go abroad after the BA because sometimes it's also good to maybe get out of your comfort zone again and go somewhere else uh, if you have the opportunity. But um, I would say we have maybe only one fifth of the students from the bachelor level decide to continue immediately on the MA level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, maybe in relation with that, uh, uh, you, you were uh, recently, or ZHDK recently uh, decided about uh, the, the reform of the, of the curricula. Uh, I don't know if it's already uh, set up or if it's a plan that will happen this year or, or next year. But could you explain us how this shift from current system goes into the shift uh, major minor? which is more American, I suppose, uh, way uh, of uh, education. And could you tell us maybe about this new curricula and eventually how, how frequent this kind of changes in, in art education uh, is happening in Switzerland? Is it something typical or is it a really one big reform in the last uh, 20 years? Um, well, I would say it's not so typical and this uh, reform concerns actually only the Zurich University of the Arts and not the other schools within Switzerland. I have to also maybe mention that Switzerland is such a small country, but there are five quite strong art schools, which is almost too much for such a small country. So we compete quite a lot with each other. Um, nevertheless, Zurich is probably the most international city and uh, it has the main airport and we are kind of the biggest, largest school as well, um, but um, of course we try to, have to also kind of distinguish our uh, curriculum to the others to be kind of more attractive. And um, the idea of major minor actually came out of the, the um, you know, um, the experience after um, um, eight years of being a big school together with the other four disciplines where we uh, realized and also out of like survey conducted uh, uh, with the students, uh, what would they wish to, to have within this kind of a big uh, big uh, uh, building, uh, small art city we have. And um, of course the outcome was that uh, lots of the students would like to collaborate with the other departments. So, you know, for example, an art student would like to collaborate in, within the music department, somebody from the drama department would like to work with a performer from the fine arts department and so on, but it was not possible. We could not kind of uh, switch uh, the students between the departments. And now the idea of major minor is kind of to establish um, uh, one curriculum where these fluidities are possible where there are programs for all of the departments, for example, the transversal minors where all the students can join, either if you're from music or if you're from drama, if you're from design or fine arts. So there will be like 
uh, 10 kind of um, general topics, you know, um, from immersive art uh, space, where students can work with um, artificial intelligence or virtual reality. Uh, artistic research is one of the topics um, and so on. We have um, different, different ideas and we're still working on the idea, so it's not completely set. Um, and then there will be also um, um, topics, uh, minors within the departments, for example, in the fine art department, I can tell you what we are working on. We're gonna have um, additional minor uh, about um, art production and art uh, handling. Um, because we know that lots of the students, when they finish the school, they often go and work in museums or work as, as archivists or work for galleries. And in Zurich, we have a quite strong scene where actually really lots of students and artists are working after they finish the art school next to the artistic practice. And uh, since the minor should also kind of add to the qualification of an art student, we were also thinking a little bit kind of more in a practical way. But nevertheless, we are we are very privileged again being in Zurich that we can work with like major collections and collectors. Like we will work with Ursula Hauser, for example, and her collection. Um, so it will be very uh, hands-on uh, uh, minor. Um, the minors are um, designed for 15 to 30 credits um, per semester. And uh, within the fine arts, we are working only at 30 degree, uh, 30 ECTS uh, modules, because we want to have them rather compact and bigger than just small. Um, another um, minor will be social arts practice, because also lots of students show um, interests to kind of focus on maybe um, uh, practices outside of the, the white cube um, and um, also do lots of like hands on collaborative projects and uh, not to focus only on this kind of individual classical um, uh, career of an artist. Um, and um, yeah, we are also working on collaborative minors, for example, within the curatorial studies and maybe uh, also uh, within uh, commissioning art for public and private uh, Commissioners. And the uh, last question, actually, because you described well the, how, how the institution works. What, what is the, what are the, the so to say, uh, institutional body criteria or, or uh, methods of, of teaching and the art pedagogy? But uh, I would be I would be curious uh, about your own artistic practice that has been concerned with details of of products, methods, and even uh, used by corporate various corporate uh, companies. Uh, you, you, you also have been dealing with, with marketing and with a certain ideas of co con consumer and production psychology. And do, do you relate the, this, uh, this uh, practice of yours to, to your job? It, it, of course you relate, but what way, how, how do you approach this, this to, uh, so to say, where it's, your world of, of artistic practice and uh, the, uh, your teaching and especially your uh, official role at the, at the academy because you are you are leading the whole department so mm -hmm. how this does go together um yeah maybe it's also interesting to mention that i am the first woman ever to run a department within the 150 uh, years of uh, the history of the Zurich university of the art school so uh, sometimes things are a little bit slower in Switzerland. <laughs> um, and I'm also, I'm the first artist running such a department. So all of my colleagues within the other departments don't come from practice. And maybe this is also maybe a new approach um, for the next generation of heads to hire people who rather come from the practice. And what I try to bring kind of my experience from what I you know learned from being an artist and um, sometimes also show the students coming from my own practice that maybe the background structures of an art productions are sometimes even more interesting than the actual product because once you know we we get into the dilemma of also producing products you know or or you know um, when when you tell the students um, and they kind of you know come and protest about something in a group and then you say yeah but in the end you all will be somehow a competition to each other you know you have to kind of um um think about it as well. And, um, and sometimes they're also very selfish, you know, they come, oh, I need 
so and so many uh, equipments for my uh, uh, production. And I said, but where is the idea? Start with the idea first and not with what you need for the idea. And so the, this kind of background structures, I think, are sometimes much more interesting than the actual outcome of um, uh, the studio work. And so we, we, we talk about that. And I think that kind of um, brings lots of new ideas as well. And I also see where people relate um, quite a lot to certain uh, practices from, you know, related to relation aesthetics where I come from. And that's kind of good to see that this kind of selfishness kind of disappears and uh, people also try to, I also really was always against also already in Sweden, there was such a big um, um, request from the students to have solo shows in the school's gallery and I completely forbid to have solo shows because I said no, if you're in the art school it's about group shows. <laughs> The group shows are much more important and also when you finish your schools, you will start with group shows, not with solo shows and uh, the group shows are the ones who, which get attention by curators by you know people from the cultural field and, and um, so you know start to think in a group and start to come up with idea within the group and we also created so called study groups um, on the master level where students um, can um, configure our own group with uh, peers um, they kind of share interests with and um, they work on topics they decided on, they get credits for it. So they're very self-independent in their study choice. And uh, we try to kind of educate them as a, you know, adult person. <laughs> so they, they have their own individual choices. And maybe also because the age is higher than in the other art schools, people are already used to kind of, um, be responsible and um, you know work on their own projects with with within a group though yeah so thank you thank you very very much Svetlana also you mentioned relational aesthetics I think it's it would be a completely different debate but it's really interesting how, how certain aspects uh, employee psychology and various marketing uh, strategies come back uh, came back recently like in a recent few five years for me it was a, a really uh, something that was very close to relational aesthetics that appeared again after years and and what is interesting that many students that deal with this question now they are not necessarily knowing about uh, actually relational aesthetics that's that's another surprise but it would be really a, a little bit different debate so thank you very much and maybe we can we, can, we will have time at the end to to discuss discuss that yeah thank you too <laughs> thank you so we will continue now with the contribution of Olaf Nikolai. Uh, Olaf Nikolai lives and works in Berlin after studying German language and literature at the University of Leipzig. He has been a visual artist since 1990s. In addition to participating in solo and group exhibitions, he has shown and documenta in 1997 and in 2017 at the 49th and 51st when is Biennale. For his work in the woods, there is a bird commissioned by Documenta 14. Olaf Nikolai was awarded Karl Schuka Prize 2017 for work, works of radio art. Olaf Nikolai has been developing his own unique form of conceptual art for the past 20 years. Based on the philosophical influence of his East German education, his work questions the aporias or contradiction, contradictions of romantic and Marxistic aesthetics. Whatever the form or medium ad adapted, photography, sculpture, publishing, design, installation, performance, the artist strives to provoke situations that engage a critical dialogue with the context in which they are born. Even in his material processes, his work subverts modes of production and the culture, economic and social references of the industrial, industrialized world. So please, can we play now? Thank you for the invitation to the symposium forming the reform. I repeat the title because when I was reading the title, I was really happy to see a kind of little grammatical detail giving a kind of dialectic. Uh, the 
active and the passive construction of forming as the active and reformed as the passive in terms of grammar. Maybe this philological interest I have made me thinking of a figure which could help to organize the reflections about this topic. And the figure is the theorist and literature um, scientist Peter Sondi. Peter Sondi was here at the Fry University active as a teacher. He established the Institute of Literature Theory and he was a rising star. He was in the 50s when he was 25 publishing a book called The Theory of Trauma which was seen as that book about trauma theory at the time and he was as well when he was teaching at the university very much engaged in the battlegrounds of engagement and autonomy in relation to the student movement. He was asked to give a statement in a court case at that time which was held against the members of the so-called Kommune Warn. Fritz Teufel, one of the members, was a student at the Freie University, at least the papers say that he was a student, and Franz Langhans. Franz Langhans and Fritz Teufel were in court because they had published a pamphlet which ended with the sentences burn, warehouse, burn. At the same time, in Brussels, a department store was set on fire. So the state attorney here in Berlin was seeing them as asking to set department stores on fire here in Berlin and wanted to send them to the prison or they wanted to make an ex state an example about this community one. Sondi in this case was asked by the defense if he could come up with a statement about the character of the pamphlet. So what was Sondi doing? Uh, he was asking, is this pamphlet a political pamphlet, a political actionist text, or is it a piece of art? This is a piece which is using fictional categories, all the means of artistic production to produce a piece what can be seen in an aesthetic product. And that was the statement he presented at court, that he sees this as a text which cannot be seen as a political pamphlet, which has to be seen as a piece which is using artistic strategies and is more or less an artistic product. In this statement, the dialectic of engagement and autonomy is very clear at work. And you can see how Sondi was positioning himself on the one side as a theorist with his tools working on a text as a philologist, and on the other side, uh, very much using these things to be engaged. I find this example something helpful to remember when we think about the question how we deal in today's situation with uh, the engagement and autonomy as something which is not excluding each other, which is on a very tricky point, are very intense connected. As I said, in 1971, Peter Sondi committed suicide just shortly before he had to start his position at the University in Zurich. That's why the Neue Zürcher Zeitung published his last or his, one of his last texts, which was a text about the poem Eden, or in German Eden, by Paul Celan. And Sondi was a close friend of uh, Paul Celan, and he was very much uh, trying to make his poetry accessible, but not in the sense that he was uh, advertising his hermetic and dark language, which most people thought Celan's poetry is speaking. He was trying to see Poland's poetry interconnected, interwoven, 
in the way how Ceylon was reflecting reality and how reality was more or less forming this poetical texts given the perspective of the individual Paul Ceylon. So in Eden he exactly did that, that he explained very much what this poem, which when you read it seems to be quite cryptical, is reflecting a day what Ceylon spent in Berlin. So Zonti gives in details and with excellence his expertise what Ceylon is referring to. So he is more or less building a network of association and references what this poetical text is creating. And so when he comes to the end, you understand how he is seeing how literature and theory are engaged in a way of reflecting and designing or making reality possible. The interesting thing starts shortly before the end, when Sondi sets a break and says, okay, what do we know now about this text as a poem, as a gedicht, as a piece of art, when we know all about these references, when we know everything, what this word or this phrase is referring to. He is not saying nothing, but he is more or less saying we don't understand why it is a piece of art, why it is a poem. And this disruptive ending is a point where Sondi, given this example of Ceylon, is putting himself a bit in the tradition of a very romantic thinking, that the only criticism of a work of art can be a work of art, that the real critic is an artist and the real criticism can be only an artwork, which also Walter Benjamin was very much attached to as an idea for criticism. What interested me in this text is again a dialectic, what I was trying to refer to of the active and the passive, which is not the positioning uh, you at the one or on the other side, on the side that all the references which are interesting and very, very um, fascinating can explain what meant forming a piece. But as well, you cannot just set yourself on the other side where you just highlight a unique and somehow not understandable access to reality that what the poet has, and that is what it is to creating an artwork. But Sondi tries to see a dialectic at work here, and he was insisting that one or the other side cannot explain or cannot help to get engaged with the artwork itself. And that is a statement which I uh, find made in 1971, still today as a very contemporary one not only interesting, which is something what I like to go back quite often and to set as an example when we talk about art. Sondi's last text about Paul Ceylon's Eden highlights a kind of two positioning, a polar field in which you find yourself very quick if you start to teach at an art academy as an artist. On the one side you have the analysis and on the other side you have the synthesis. The analysis is very helpful to understand and to reflect methods and techniques and to analyze how a piece was made, how a piece is constructed what are the possible functions, the structures, whatever of this piece. But these analyses are not giving you any recipe how to produce anything. It just gives you a toolbox which each person or collective needs to start to use for themselves and for their needs. How do you position yourself as a teacher in such a process? This is a question what 
I was facing when I entered the academy in Munich as a teacher. And as I put it uh, in an ironic way, the first week being a teacher at this academy was the longest period what I ever had spent in an art academy. Florian Pumhösel already gave a short uh, impression how teaching at the Munich Academy is organized with the system of classes. And I think he described quite well that you are turned between the activity to form a collective as a productive field for production and as well paying attention to the individual points uh, and interests and helping people to find a way how they positioning themselves. What I found helpful for myself when I remember Sunday's uh, analysis and the way I organize my teaching is the concept of the individual as a medium. The individual as a medium means for me not so much uh, that it is a very unicorn identity what we're speaking about if we call individuals. It is about the idea that we as individuals are composed, as Marx once put it in the Feuerbach thesis, an ensemble of the surroundings, an ensemble of the gesellschaftliche Verhältnisse, the ensembles of the relations, the social relations, and the, the relations we have and we are formed by. So we are formated by a network of activities as well, which we, when we are producing, activate. So an artist today is never working alone, also if he is like a poet sitting at his desk. But in fact, the production of artists are very widespread and collaborative ones as well. In the early 90s, the novelist Neil Stevenson created the term avatar, and it was one of the most successful terms, metaphors, created because Stevenson was a close friend of people who worked at that time at Apple Company. So they took up avatar as a helpful tool to create a navigation system where you can identify with as a substitute for you and your activities. So when I talk about the individual as a medium and or as an avatar, then uh, the idea of analysis and instructions and this dialectic of analysis and instructions come in a different way into place than in the teaching as I tell you a method how to do and what to do and I give you the categories, what I have and you have to follow them. Mostly I find myself in a position that I have to say I don't know. But I want to create out of this dilemma a productive field. So the avatar and the medium, these are terms which not only as metaphors, also as active tools helping me to design the field, what I'm positioning myself, my activity while teaching in. In the last years in our academy in Munich, there was an intense discussion about a new study regulation, which also uh, has in mind to think about if the system of classes, how it is organized, is still a contemporary uh, method, or is it still something which needs to be reformed. In this uh, discussion, there was also a preamble for the whole study regulations, in which some sentences needed to be articulated, what is the goal of the academy, what is the idea, what the academy is doing. And it was a statement first presented, which uh, said, we try to educate successful artists. I didn't agree with this statement at all. And I was trying to find a way, how can I articulate what I think an art academy is about? And I must be honest, it is very difficult for me still today to identify this. But what it is for sure, it is not to introduce the term success and also a term of a profession as something what in this uh, institution is the most interesting thing you can reach. What I found 
helpful is the term attitude. Also in the sense, as Harald Seemann put it with his exhibition, when attitude becomes form, but attitude in a general way as a position from where you can organize your praxis, where you have an idea where you are wanting to head towards to, how you are dealing with reality, which kind of realities you are interested in, and that you have a high knowledge of artistic methods, aesthetic knowledge you can use to deal with. That is maybe in a very vague way the articulation I would have tried to put into sentences. The attitude comes very close with another term I would like as a method to highlight. It is the what if. Liam Gillick was very often using it as a term to describe his own artistic approaches. But the what if is exactly what is the way of fictional thinking. The way how when I go back to Peter Sondi's statement in the court case that he said if somebody is reflecting in artistic or aesthetic strategies about what if, it doesn't mean that he is telling you immediately act, do this and be the political active part in the process. So what Sondi was at that time highlighting, which I think is still important today, that politics and art are extremely linked, but they are not identical. The attitude and the what if, these are the two helpful terms I still uh, thinking about. And an institution as an art academy is that where these two ways of producing, these ways of thinking, these ways of being active, that to find attitudes, to articulate attitudes, and to keep the field of what if open is essential because this is a place where you have freedom, freedom and autonomy. I use these two words which are very vague, which are very open for interpretation, I know that, but I don't have other ones at hand right now. And the independence of such a space is more than necessary. Why? When we think about the what if, we think about our ability to fictionalize, the ability for different worlds, the ability of fantasy, let's put it that way. The poet Marcel Bayer was once uh, presenting a text about bird watching in the Gulf War. One of an American soldiers were um, describing his bird watchings at the war zone. And Marcel Bayer is somebody who is very interested in how people are using language and how these uses of language are opening doors which are closed so far. And one of the ways how people who birdwatch describe the birds is that they have to be accurate, they have to be extremely precise because sometimes they don't know exactly what they are describing. So maybe somebody in the future will pick up this description and can identify something what was at the time when the description was made made not possible to identify. What I mean, what Marcel Bayer was uh, saying is, we have to be precise because our fantasy is limiting us as well. The framework with our, which we are in in our fantasies is a framework which we want to transgress, but we can maybe transgress us just by being precise, because somebody who is outside this framework in the future can identify things because of this precise description which we were not able to see. So the changes of gaze as a possibility, that is something what is very important. And I think an institution which is open, independent, needs to see this as something which is very important as an open field. Or to put it very shortly, also the institutions has to be organized in a way that it all the time asking for itself and its structures, what if. That's why I chose the image, what you can see right now while I'm talking, 
of a piece by Mladen Stilinovic, which is called The Shoelace, because better than this image, I can't express what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Olaf. And I apologize uh, that by technical mistake, I think we included some some of the images in the wrong way, right? The, the word... At least the shoelace should have been ninety degrees <laughs> rotated. Uh... <laughs> I know this is the problem. I think since the beginning that uh, somehow uh, there was a technical mistake. So I think people uh, understood that actually it was. Uh, it was really rotated uh, the images and thank you for for introducing uh, these metaphors like avatar and uh, it, the third thought like about the framework framework of our fantasies was uh, was really interesting that actually even if we are fictional fictional fictionalizing then uh, of course we are moving within the frameworks that that are in a way limited so uh, we will we will have time to discuss after after the, all the contributions. I will move now to to uh, to the next one, who is from uh, Pavel Steret, who was born in 1985 in Prague, where he still lives and works. He studied in Brno in Prague and Vienna, and graduated at the Fine Arts Academy in Prague, where he studied under Vladimir Skrepel, Jiří Kovanda, Zbigniew Libera, and Pavel Aldhammer. Currently, he teaches at the Intermediate Department of the Faculty of Fine Arts at the Technical University in Brno. Pavel Steretz moves over his work for a long time. He combines performance, object, installation, photography, and other media in a, in a variety of ways. His interest circles around the issues of research, science, museums, and archive, social structures and our dependency on tangible and symbolic capital. These days, he's one of a wave of artists who expresses themselves through the social environment and its semantic and metaphorical potential. As he himself writes, I experiment on a small scale with social engineering as an artistic procedure. Please, can we play? the contribution of Pavel. Donedávna byla umělecká škola, někdy se stopou pohrdání, ale většinou s láskou a obdivem přirovnávána ke skleníku podporujícímu růst, prostor, prostý nástrah povětří a mrazu tam venku. Dnes toto přirovnání nesedí, a je třeba promyslet školu spíše jako deprivační komoru. Skleník, kromě světla, vpouští také obdivující nebo dozrující pohled. V současnosti je však potřeba zcela zhasnout nebo spíše umělecké školy rovnou oslepit. Se spožděním několika dekád se do uměleckého vzdělání triumfálně začlenila dematerializovaná tvorba a postkoncept, a to i v regionech mimo západní Evropu a USA sugestivně a sebevědomně představené dematerializované něco a performativní něco konečně došlo uznání i od doposavat brblajících tradičnějších frakcí klauzurních komisí, jinak notoricky postrádajících řemeslo, um a trvalou hodnotu. Nevadí tolik, že je to pozdě, ale hlavně to samo o sobě nestačí. Široké uznání dematerializované tvorby, obracející pozornost od věcí na osobnost tvůrce a jeho kulturní, ale i sociální kapitál, se stalo spíše součástí problému než jeho řešením. Žijeme v době, kdy se postmateriální mládež stala sama komoditou obchodovanou v online prostředí. Umělecké školy dnes chrlí kvanta kreativního obsahu na neustále sebe vykořišťovaných tělech ve svegu, umě a s řemeslem aranžovaných pro Instagram, Facebook a TikTok. Tento obsah je však z větší části monetizován jinde a někým jiným. Sugestivní a sebevědomý projev vztahem na influencerství skrze počet schlédnutí je úmornou a zcela pohlcující neplacenou prací, nevolnictvím kognitivního kapitalismu. Reciproční odměňování druhých zbytkem své pozornosti je jen dalším aspektem téhož. Umělecké školy jsou s tímto vykořišťováním minimálně komplicitní. Nekonečné reaktualizace identit vybrušování dokumentace a frenetické sdílení, vizibilita, 
erotizace a hashtagizace estetických, teoretických a politických kategorií v tvorbě se rozmáhají napříč ateliéry. Registr uměleckých výkonů nepohltil jen pedagogy, ale jsou do něj zapojováni i studenti, obdobně jako do propagace ateliérů na sítích. Ze školy hrou se stala gamifikovaná těžba pozornosti a skórování na fiktivních žebříčcích. Pokud mají školy vytvářet prostředí pro rozvoj tvorby ve prospěch svých studentů, tak se musí vzdát přitakání kognitivnímu kapitalismu a neoliberální výchovy a musí být schopné vytvořit prostředí chráněné před obsedantně kompulzivní sebeprezentací a sdílením. Rezistence nevzniká ignorací nebo pokusem o regres do stavu před diktaturu korporátního kognitariátu. Nervová soustava neustále stimulovaná drobnými vzruchy ze sociálních sítí vede sice k absenci nudy, ale zároveň k otupění, depresivitě a neschopnosti bavit se nebo odpočívat a také k neschopnosti některých způsobů empatie, psychofyzického sdílení přítomného a tím i neodcizené tvorby. Erodovaná pozornost a znecitlivění k nižším dávkám dopaminu, způsobená neustálou stimulací centra satisfakce, vyžaduje cílenou odpověď vzdělávacích institucí. Je naším úkolem vytvořit prostředí odstíněné od rušivých notifikací, které nás mají udržet v obraze, stejně jako bodově vykazatelného hodnocení sloužícího jako šedítka. Zbavit se algoritmického dohledu a sdílení alespoň v rámci prvních fází tvorby, protože právě to dnes dělá ateliér tvůrčím prostorem. Faradajova klec je tím, čím kdysi byla velká ateliérová okna. Jako zaměstnanci uměleckých škol se už musíme přestat poplácávat po zádech za svůj progresivismus v přijímání nového umění a začít vytvářet slepou skvrnu, umožňující alespoň v perimetru školy demontovat panoptikon, v kterém jsme jinak spolu se studenty zároveň vystaveni i uvězněni. Jednou z oblastí, kde je možné se inspirovat, je rave. Řada míst, kde jsou párty dnes pořádány, musí splňovat hlavně podmínku snížené viditelnosti a panuje v nich často striktní no fotopolitika. Ideální je vidět tak 20 cm dopředu, aby se předešlo nárazu. Někde se přelepují a nebo rovnou po dobu trvání deponují mobilní telefony. Právě taková místa jsou prostory nové intimity. Místa, kde se posluje obrany schopnost před úzkostí, disocujeme se od traumat všudy přítomného dohledu a sebeprezentace a psychofyzicky se synchronizujeme podle BPM. Škola není postklub může někdo namítnout, je však podezřelé a podobně excentrické, když od různých pedagogů na vysokých uměleckých školách slýcháme otřepanou frázi o tom, že umění nejde naučit. Jakou legitimitu taková škola potom má? S oprávněným odklonem od tlaku na řemeslnou bravúru, která tak jako tak nestihla rapidní technologické a diskuzivní proměny současné tvorby, vede toto přesvědčení k naprostému odklonu od pedagogiky. Učit řemeslo není vzhledem k charakteru současné tvorby možné, zároveň však není vhodné učit umění, protože komu není dáno, tomu není pomoci. Navíc jsme znovu oprávněně zpochybnili i model tzv. mistrovské školy. Školám, kde se neučí, zbývá pouze vykazování činnosti v provozu umění. Hodnocení kvality, výroba certifikovaných profesionálů a odpadu. Pedagogické minimum není pro výuku na vysoké škole požadováno a i kdyby bylo, tak lze standardně zajistit jen konvenční kurz, který neodpovídá specifickým potřebám. Zapomíná se na to, že se dá a je dokonce vhodné učit a odnaučovat na vysokých uměleckých školách ještě jiné věci, které nejsou ani technicistně pojatým řemeslem, ani výsostným uměním. Jaké věci by to měly být? Vyvolejme pro tento účel ducha Komenského a vzbuďme v prostředí uměleckých škol zájem o metodologii vzdělání, ačkoliv je to pro mnohé přízemí. Při takové pobídkám na připomínku Komenského 350. výročí a naplníme je možná trochu ahistorickým, ale o to víc k současníkům promlouvajícím obsahem, který bude, ostatně zcela v duchu Komenského, odporovat současné ideologii neoliberálního vzdělání, stejně jako za minulého režimu, odporoval reálně socialistickému školství. Komenský byl především náboženský radikál a každé dobové čtení, oproštěné od náboženského obsahu, bude pouze interpretací podléhající ideologizaci. Buďme ideologičtí a představme si, jak by vypadala reforma uměleckého školství skrze spekulativní čtení Komenského. Pedagogika je věda o posloupnostech a průchodnostech, ale zvláště v komenského pojetí také o rovnosti, dostupnosti, proti úzké specializaci za vše nápravu. 
jak si v souladu s takovým pohledem na vzdělání vedou naše umělecké školy, všechno všem vše strany. Běžnou praxí napříč uměleckými školami je, že se studenti ve své práci volně vztahují k oblastem, které se dotýkají skutečně všemožných oblastí lidského i nelidského vědění a konání a dělají to skrze široký repertoár médií a postupů. Ochota umělců vyjadřovat se k otázkám od jaderné fyziky po hru na klavír dnes celou řadu lidí děsí a nebo přinejmenším znechucuje. Obdobně úzkoprse nás přivádí k úsměvu údajná najevita pancofických snah. Komenský však nesoupeřil s Bohem o vševědění ve snaze se mu faustovsky vyrovnat. Na to byl příliš pokorným věřícím. Pan Sofie je moudrost utvářená skrze holistické nazírání světa oproti vševědoucnosti ve smyslu vyčerpávajícího výřadu jednotlivých znalostí. Tvorba encyklopedií a didaktik je nástrojem ne cílem. Pan Sofie je stejně jako současná hlubiná ekologie, systémová věda nebo teorie komplexity, především synkretickým myšlením, kladoucím důraz na vztahy, propojení a celek. Je znakem pošetilosti chtít raději léčit jednotlivý út než celé tělo, píše Komenský. Všem všechno vše straně. Snaha o vytvoření jednotného evropského univerzitního prostoru, díky níž dnes třeba jezdí studenti na Erasmus, je nazývána zkratkovitě Boloňský proces a ten podnítil mimo jiné také vznik doktorského stupně studia i na školách mimo tradiční vědní disciplíny. Doktorské studium je zároveň v jiném ustanovení evropského orgánu schodně podmíněno prováděním výzkumu. Náhodný souběh doporučení a ustanovení zajistil to, že se vynořil na světlo světel třeba umělecký výzkum. Jen díky němu mohou umělci studující doktorát provádět místo nekvalifikovaného výzkumu vědeckého svébytný a nově zrovnoprávněný výzkum umělecký. Právě rozpoznání výzkumu jako doslovně každé systematické činnosti rozvíjející vědění je kruciální nejen pro uznání uměleckého výzkumu, což by možná nebylo tak podstatné, ale třeba i výzkumu indigenního nebo výzkumu prováděného manuálně pracujícími stejně jako nelidskými badateli. Umělecké školy by měly podpořit své studenty a dát jim nástroje, jak obhájit své pan a interdisciplinární bádání skrze kritickou reflexi konvenčně pojímané západní epistemologie. Stejně jako může studium utopií vést k rozšíření politické a společenské představivosti, pan Sofie stimuluje představivost epistemologickou. Všestraně všechno všem. Ve středověkých školách staré Evropy se na jednom místě sice vyskytovalo množství studentů, ale pedagog se k ním obracel výhradně individuálně. Komenský podporoval vznik učebnic a metodologických příruček, protože ty umožňovaly kolektivní výuku, která tak mohla být dostupnější, respektive dostupná všem. Současné vysoké umělecké školy často formálně udržují model středověké mistrovské školy, kde se předpokládá individuální výuka, ale zároveň se pod finančním a politickým tlakem masifikovaly. Takže jiná než kolektivní výuka není možná. Neodpovídají tomu však metody ani učební materiály. Podpora vzniku skript a učebnic je na vysokých uměleckých školách střední Evropy zcela minimální. Zmatek a nemožnost se vracet k probrané látce na atelérových zkouškách a často i přednáškách bez jakékoliv struktury je spíše pravidlem než výjimkou. Všechno vše straně všem. Přes neutuchající zájem Komenského zařadit do ezoterních tradic ze strany různých tajných hnutí, třeba zednářů, se to přesvědčivě nedařilo a nedaří. Proč? Protože Komenský byl přes různé paralely s těmito hnutími ve svém přístupu k vědění radikálně exoterní. Ezoterie je plná tajemství, exkluzivní pro zasvěcené a proto plná nadřazenectví. Exoterie je demokratická, přístupná bez rozdílu všem. V labirintu světa a ráji srdce, sepsaném 9 let po publikaci prvního roze kruciánského manifestu, pojednal Komenský o roze kruciánských textech, ideích a symbolech nabízených na tržišti v drakonicky satirickém duchu. Každému pak, kdo kupoval, zapovědělo se odvírati. Nebo tajné té moudrosti, že taková je moc, že pronikáním operuje, ale kdyby se odevřela, že by vypáchla. Umělecké školy musí stejně exoterně přistupovat k umění a nedělat z něj exkluzivní zboží. Na tržišti současné tvorby by to totiž působilo komicky. Pokud se otevřená umělecká škola jeví prázdná, pak z ní nemělo ani co vyvanout. Otevřená přitom nutně neznamená pod drobnohledem, ale přístupná i bez vstupních klíčů, předporozumění a kapitálu. Všem všestraně všechno. Komenský, později obrozenci titulovaný učitel národů, 
překračoval ve skutečnosti koncept národní identity ve všech směrech, stejně jako politické hranice. Jeho úvahy o novém univerzálním jazyce, význam, který překládal latině, zároveň však i místním jazykům, poukazují na jeho schopnost myslet univerzalisticky, avšak zároveň tak, jak to dnes vyjadřujeme termínem glokalita. Během svého života zažil tři epidemie, náboženskou nesnášenlivost, nucený exil i živelné katastrofy. Jeho zkušenost a všenápravný a tedy dost aktivistický étos se nás v pozdním kapitalismu během stupňujícího se rozkladu ekosystému v celoplanetárním měřítku týká více, než bychom si chtěli připustit. Komenský se na nás dívá skrze matné sklivce kamenných byst umístěných skoro před každou základní školou, ale jsme to my, kdo ho v jeho radikalitě často vůbec nevidí. Vše straně, všem, všechno. Thank you very much, Pavel, for your... You are welcome. I hope that you didn't mind too much to read it uh, on the screen, but I couldn't like squeeze it in English and uh, I mean in this like time frame because I'm uh, less, you know, like uh, quick in English, but now I can uh, talk about it uh, with, with you or if you have some questions. Or I can present a bit my methods. Uh, uh, how do you see our conversation right now? We, we actually, what we do, we will play the last contribution and we will have, uh, we will have a discussion after. It was very much a kind of manifestation statement about the future of, uh, of the art school that is that resembles more to the privation chamber than uh, a greenhouse. So <laughs> I think it will it will uh, bring a lot of questions and, and comments. I hope. Uh, and uh, I will introduce the la last contribution, and then there will be uh, there will be Q and A questions answers uh, round after the last contribution. The last contribution is from Jiří Kovanda, who was born in 1953 in Prague. And uh, he spent his childhood and youth in Strašnice, where he attended Julius Fučík Primary School. He was not accepted to the grammar school due to poor results at the entrance, entrance exams. So his father entered him at, uh, as a construction apprentice in Prague. His apprenti apprenticeship was completed by the Maturita exam, after which from 1977, he worked as a surveyor in the construction of Prague uh, subway. Then he was employed in the depository of the National Gallery in Prague. Since the late 1970s, he focused on performance. He stood in the opposite direction on the moving stairs and looked into someone else's face, or he stood with his arms spread in the Wenceslas Square. Kovanda's activity was documented by a photographer. Since his goal was to dis disseminate the performances, the photographs were exhibited in the West as well. He and other Czech performers put an end to the performances at the turn, at the turn of the 1970s and 80s. He appreciated the political change in 1989 as it provided him with an opportunity to present his art in public. He remained in the National Gallery until 1995, and since then, he has worked at uh, Avu in Prague, where he teaches, and Faculty of Art and Design in Ústí nad Labem. <coughs> so, I would uh, please can we uh, play the last contribution? From letters to a colleague on a rational approach to teaching. Artistic creation is a fragile, delicate, and ephemeral thing that springs forth from more than just acquired skills and that truly cannot be assessed in an entirely objective manner. Our task should thus be to promote students in their work, to encourage them, to awaken their desire to reveal and test things, and not to traumatize them and rob them of this desire. Although I understand the demands that you place on students, I'm convinced that they do not always fall on fertile soil. What stimulates one person may instead discourage another. Some people respond by truly shifting into high gear, while others decide that next time they'd rather go out dancing. The first and foremost task of an art school is not to educate elite artists, but to present young people with various possibilities 
and ways of seeing that they do not get from practical life. After all, it is clear that there cannot be as many elite artists as there are students at an art school. But this does not mean that the work done by the great majority of artists is redundant. And we should punish only those who clearly do not pay sufficient attention to their work and consciously fail to take advantage of all that they have at their disposal. I simply look at it other way, the other way around. Take that mountain. You write that initial awe or simpler perception comes first. Then follows the entire process that leads us towards sense, towards meaning. By comparison, I believe we need to get rid of meanings and to aim for the core, for this initial, initial law or simple perception. When we look at a mountain, we know what it is called, where it lies on the map, what role it played in history, etc., etc. But we do not see the mountain. When we see it, the important thing is not the mountain, but experience. Here I am speaking for myself personally. But I tried to imagine that someone else might look at that mountain and learn what it is called, where it lies on the map, what role it played in history, etc., etc. They don't see the mountain, but they are thinking, comparing, placing it into context. Because when you're thinking, the important thing is not the mountain, but experience, through which you arrive at awe or simple perception, but not of that mountain. Ten paragraphs on the subject of how to do it. I don't know. And that is why I want to do something. Not in order to learn something, not to master something that others achieved before me, but in order to try to explore unsensed or hidden possibilities. It is therefore more fruitful to ask than to live in the illusion that I know. Two, I don't want to be a teacher who instructs. It is not knowledge that is the most valuable thing. I want to intensely share this moment with you. I want to help so that we may experience it as strongly as possible, just like you can help me. Three, I'm not a master on a pedestal. I have exactly the same abilities as you. I cannot do any more than you. The only thing I can do is to encourage. Try that, let's do it. Four, studio work should be a collaborative effort not just between student and teacher, but also amongst the students themselves. We are all in the same boat and let the helm be taken by whoever feels up to it at the moment. Five. Once, when talking about the name of the studio, someone suggested calling it, more as a joke, the playground, but they weren't so far off the mark. More than a classroom, a workshop, or a laboratory, a studio should resemble a children's playground. Six. You don't always have to be serious. Wild and fun play is also a meaningful possibility. The children in a sandbox take playing very seriously. Seven, laughter is very, very important. Eight, above all, we should not have any prepared program. Let's let everything flow according to its own pace. Let's observe all that comes with watchful anticipation and let's try to catch that wave. Let's allow ourselves to be surprised. Flowing water is alive, still water begins to rot. Nine, let's go to work with a full awareness that we might fail. I don't know how it will turn out, and that is what is so valuable. Let's not be afraid to make mistakes, for mistakes bring as much learning as success. 10, our work does not end when we leave the studio. Let's not divide our activities into work and entertainment. That perfect moment when something new opens itself to us can come even when we're having a beer or sitting in a cafe. Let's set out to meet at any time and anywhere possible. Art is not work. Art is a state of mind. Postscriptum. The main problem is not to find the strengths and weaknesses of how to teach. I don't mean to say that everything is perfect, but I am concerned that we might use the system's deficiencies to mask our own. Because good teachers can, if they are given the proper space and opportunities, do well even under conditions that are not entirely as they would like. And not even a perfect system can guarantee a perfect study environment. I'm not arguing for the status quo, nor am I against change, but I am warning that we must not let change become a cover. 
Frenetic organizational activities must not be simplified and allowed to obscure what should be the main purpose of an art school's activities. Not even the most perfect system can guarantee that instruction will hand over a truly deep and meaningful understanding and comprehension of what artistic creation means and has to offer. Only people can do that. An attempt at answering the question, is this even art? Number one, a framed object hanging on the wall is not art. Number two, this object merely has a form that we tend to place in the category of artwork. Number three, but this object is not art and, and of itself. It is merely fabric onto which someone has applied pigments in some manner, and the whole thing was then placed in a frame. Number four, art is elsewhere. Number five, art is what happens when I look at the painting, when I perceive it, experience it. Number six, art cannot be localized. Art is everywhere between the painting and his viewer. Number seven, art is therefore immaterial, ungraspable, always transcending rational and sensory perception. Number eight, a good work of art is always beautiful, even if it might not seem that way when it is being made. When I say beautiful, I mean beautiful, not pretty. Beautiful means that it does not evoke merely a pleasant feeling in our brain through our eyes, but that it reaches deeper, that it touches our heart. Number nine, anything can be a work of art. Anything that an artist calls his or her artwork. Anything they point to in all seriousness and with intense passion say, there it is, I see it, you try it too. Number 10, an interpretation of a work of art is not art. It is an aid, a guide, something like a walking stick and solid hiking boots, but it's up to you to take the journey. Number 11, any artwork in his interpretation remains limited, bound, and complete, like an animal in a cage. But we build zoos in order to better learn from a about animals and then go find the true free animal. Thanks to Yuri Kovanda, who is not with us. And now you can you can actually switch on the cameras and microphones, dear colleagues. I think we, we had quite nice, the last two contributions were quite controversial to each other, I think. And uh, <laughs> kind of, uh, <coughs> one was, the last one was, was purely uh, kind of, even uh, was, I would, I would call it kind of perceptional mode of art kind of green, in a Greenberg, Greenbergian sense on one hand, on the other hand, it's very much uh, linked with, with, with an idea of, of perception. Even if, if Komanda said that art is actually ungraspable even uh, for, for a perceptory uh, mode of, uh, of understanding or uh, acquirement. So, uh, yeah, so basically I didn't prepare any questions at the end, so I would be very happy if you could comment, contribute, uh, explain better what has been not said in your contributions. I think they were quite uh, precise. I have some questions, but uh, there, there are rather small questions to, to each of you. So I would very much would like to invite you and, and give your uh, comments to what has been said today. If you can uh, react like that. Uh, that would be great. Uh, if there are some questions, please, uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, all participants and uh, uh, of the webinar to, to write their questions in the chat. Please write your uh, comments or questions in the chat. Also on YouTube, it's the same. I think we don't have a kind of immediate possibility for you to, uh, to from technical reasons uh, to to talk so so better if you if you write it in the in the chat
I know it's difficult. It's not easy to start, but uh, do you feel do you feel warmed enough to to start, or shall I ask something? I think you should ask because, for example, I have a lot of questions to Kovan. That is not you. <laughs> Well, so uh, my, my first question would, would go to Paul Petrich, actually, because uh, f f what was striking to me was the image. I would like to ask Paul about the image, because uh, he used the, the video of, uh, of himself uh, kind of uh, digging, digging the eyes. And uh, I think it was not, uh, of course, by coincidence that you use this image. So, so actually, what this uh, kind of uh, digging meant in relation with the, with the school? Maybe could you connect it with, with what has been said? What is the relation of this kind of pretty absurd ab uh, activity of, of actually drawing yourself in the, in the cold water within the being a teacher uh, at the Academy of the uh, uh, Angevante, for example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, I never studied art. And um, so for me, um, I just, so um, when, when you came up with the question attending at this uh, symposium, um, I uh, searched for the curriculum of, of the university and it's seven pages of the PDF. And um, it's, um, not long, it's not very complex, it, it's not very difficult to understand. And, and um, I, what I wanted to point out is that I think the cur curriculum is one thing and maybe it's important for, a, for an institution. And the other thing is that, uh, that we expect uh, from the students or from us as teachers, um, uh, everything else. So um, here I see that it's a, it's a it's, it's, uh, we want to have um, uh, discussion, opposition, uh, agony, agony vege, so, so. Um, this is why I chose this uh, video uh, showing almost no um, framing. Let's say it like that. Thank you. Yeah. I, actually, I have a question for Olaf. I, I wanted to know how was the first week at the academy. You mean um, when I was the first week in the art academy? Yes, because you said it. it yeah, it, I mean it was quite. Uh, the, the Munich Art Academy is really special in this case. It is not very institutionalized, and so it was an interesting meeting with the students. But I was uh, this class what I took over. They didn't had a teacher for more than two years. So it was quite uh, an intense moment to understand also what are the expectations of students who are engaging with you. And uh, it was also very difficult for me to make clear to them that I'm not there to tell them anything. So they were expecting a lot. So I think the uh, first week for them was quite disappointing. Mm -hmm. So but um, it was interesting to find out that uh, there is a way how we could engage, but it was also that at the same time I had a long-term uh, performance piece uh, in Munich on what they could also see, how I see my way of working. And uh, so that was helpful that they could study a bit of my practice, not to imitate it. And the most difficult thing was uh, to find out what their interests are. And also to, um, as it was said, to stop this process of presenting themselves as a possible pos uh, possible artist as a possible successful artist and also stopping to study role models so it's very much about role models i would not say that i don't have role models everybody has them but uh, the the role models there were quite obvious and commodified and the the process of commodification uh, is a one what I'm dealing in my work with, and I not only see it only as a negative thing, because the idea of an independent freedom artist is a result of the 18th century capitalist market. 
So if you see it a bit more in a historical way, and you want not to depend on the state or on private finances, you need to deal with uh, the idea of an economy. But in which way are you dealing with it? In a capitalist way or in a different way than a capitalist? So these all these questions were already in the first week at stake. It was quite interesting. And Munich is also a very special uh, uh, academy because it's a very expensive city to live. So you have also a very specific uh, crowd of people who are applying at the academy because people are not in the beginning this is now 10 years ago when i started there was quite a social mix what i observed in the last 10 years is that the application is coming more and more from a unified social class which is middle class and a bit higher education but you rarely find people from different backgrounds applying at the art academies anymore, mm -hmm. which I found an alarming signal. Mm -hmm. There is a question to search in relation with this, because you, you were mentioning, uh, you were mentioning uh, that you, you, that at ZHDK you accept this vocation of students, right? And if you could tell us a little bit how big percentage of the school, how important and how, how big and how amazing are the, the workshops, right? Um, we, sorry. Uh, uh, can, you, uh, can you try to turn off uh, your webcam? You had some kind of uh, big... Uh, um, lagging of uh, sound. You all should do that. Uh, I mean, uh, have, uh, have to turn yeah. off, uh, again. I could not understand the question. Sorry, Vid. <laughs> <laughs> Me not either. <laughs> uh, so, but then I ask you, Svetlana. Is it, is, uh, uh, maybe, is it better? Maybe before. Better now, yes. I, comment maybe on Olaf's uh, um, statement because we actually see the opposite that we have more more diverse applicants than when I for example studied at the Academy of Applied Arts in Vienna and um, this kind of elitist ideas to admit rather a small group of people is also kind of obsolete nowadays because I remember when I was studying in Vienna for example, Helmut Lang, who was teaching fashion at the time, he admitted only one student at one point. Um, and there were hundreds of people applying. And um, it also kind of showed a certain uh, power of the professor at a time, which nowadays we don't have. It would be not possible to admit only one student and say out of um, 100 people, only one student was an excellent uh, person. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say on our side, we see actually the opposite. We have more diverse uh, um, applicants and more diverse students body. Also, maybe it's um, to mention that um, the student university, uh, the, the Zurich University of the Arts has quite low fees, uh, tuition fees, which some people might not think of when they think of Switzerland, but uh, we charge 700 Swiss francs per semester. Uh, and for the foreign students, I think it's 1,200 per semester, which of course for certain countries it might be high, but on a general um, level, uh, they are quite low. And I would um, have to say we have students, most of the students are working next to the uh, uh, art school, next to the education. Uh, I think uh, from the survey, we see that almost 85% students are working next to the university. Um, so I cannot confirm. I would say it actually changed to the better now than when I used to study. Maybe I can a little bit comment on, on you because uh, here uh, in Czech Republic, we don't have uh, uh, fortunately any fees, uh, mm -hmm. but still uh, the most of the applicants are coming from uh, the like middle classes and uh, uh, but uh, the art school uh, has ability to integrate people being systematically uh, like um, uh, 
like erased from the from the higher education uh, for example like uh, roma minority here etc you know they had problems in the elementary and uh, high school and the art school can accept here in czech republic also uh, people without uh, maturity mm -hmm. so like with this ex uh, exception and we can even uh, uh, like uh, gave them some uh, stipends but and the studying is for free so now it's more about uh, like um sh like showing to those uh groups of uh, uh, people that the art school may uh, be the good place for them although for example they uh, never thought that they will study art etc mm -hmm. you know but it's uh, maybe another you know i'm just uh, uh, speaking about this because it's kind of like my agenda now uh, a lot to to yeah uh, to we bring can, uh, uh, diverse people we can also connect with that uh, Pavel I think maybe because there might be some interesting ideas we could exchange we also have a program for refugees and it's very similar for maybe like young people who could not or would not consider in their own countries to go and study art because that was basically out of questions or out of their even imagination, um, who get the chance to kind of uh, first kind of um, try things out for uh, one year, and then they can go through the admission procedure and be admitted as regular students. And we also have stipends for such people. And I've developed here, but in a really like grassroots way, because the school was not so much like helping me with that. But um, I'm already for I, I think three or four years uh, contacting different um, uh, like social workers uh, uh, and they are in everyday touch with uh, uh, people like coming from like super like uh, uh, like poor families or yeah like Roma and other and refugees as well and um, because often those social workers they don't know anything about the art schools and they they have all those like prejudices that you need to be like super good in uh, like uh, this classical uh, techniques etc uh, so the first is to to convince and bring to the school those social workers and then they are in everyday contact with their uh, the client is terrible work but with with, uh, with the people uh, and uh, they can like motivate them and uh, maybe find out that they are uh, talented in certain ways. And uh, uh, then they connect me with those students. So I have some time to work with them on uh, their portfolios. And uh, because usually they, like if you Google uh, how the portfolio should look like, you have all these like portfolios coming from, and they are coming usually uh, uh, those same people from completely different, uh, um, uh, uh, like with completely different symbolic capital, and you know, like coming from different fields. And if they don't know anyone, like no, like they, they uh, so uh, I'm just uh, somehow like trying to equal, like to put them on the equal level uh, with the pre knowledge as the like most more privileged middle class uh, students and it's like slow process but it works like this uh, quite well but i can um i i think that this can also uh, even work on the international level that um, and right now for example we are ex accepting uh, uh, quite few belarusians because uh, um Czech language, like it says, a Slavic language, like they can learn uh, very quickly because you don't pay in Czech Republic for the school if you study in Czech language, but they can adapt in like three months or something because in the art school, the language is not that, that important. Like it's important, but they can survive somehow. Yeah, we have a very similar structure with the social worker. As you said, we have to convince them first that art is also beyond like being super skilled. Uh, but we have quite lots, um, uh, some people who are very uh, advanced, for example, in sound um, or in film and who found their way into the art school and are very happy to be there. Yeah. And we are happy to have them. Yeah. Beat is lost. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> So I think I will. It will work better without uh, without the image. 
maybe uh, what, one question to to Pavel. Uh, I, I was thinking about uh, when when you when you talk about uh, it was quite ambitious plan for <laughs> or manifesto of future uh, future. Uh, Art Academy, maybe I was thinking very much about Bauhaus in two moments. One one moment was when you were talking about this call for the texts for the books that should be written, and it's something that that happened on on uh, Bauhaus systematically. That actually the uh, Kandinsky, Claire, everyone almost uh, wrote a book about uh, what, what shall be art teaching, right? And and second moment was. Uh, this call for kind of universal empowerment, pan-Sophia, again, this complexity that, that, that these books embrace the world, they start really from the, from the cosmos, from, from the kind of metaphysics. So uh, do, do, do you think, is there a connection or not really? Like, I haven't read all the Bauhaus uh, books, but... Uh... Uh, as I remember at least uh, some of those texts, they are often uh, like too much like philosophical thinking about the role of art and, you know, and okay, there is some methodology, but I, I mean, and when I'm calling in my uh, text about, you know, like, uh, like basic pedagogy uh, 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 being rehabilitated in the art schools, uh, I think that uh, we are lacking some like uh, uh, like scripts and you know like this like school books uh, uh, like not not like philosophical texts uh, not uh, yeah like um, uh, like very practical because the students are just like lost because everything is you know like uh, blurred and art and too much artistic and uh, you know it's um, and usually. Uh, the the pedagogues in the art schools they don't have uh, uh, any pedagogical education they are, you know like it's uh, it's only based on their uh, interesting careers or charisma but it's um, uh, somehow not enough for the school and for the students like it's not uh, it's not helping them and now uh, especially in these times you know they are they are lost because yeah there is like no yeah like you know, um, it's not that there is like no uh, like site material. We are just like, or in our university, uh, we are now and in my studio uh, because we don't have any scripts either. Uh, I'm just like sending them some materials. We are sometimes, uh, uh, you know, like discussing same stuff, you know, over and over again. And then the other uh, students are coming next year, but the the uh, students who have been studying there uh, for uh, some time, it's not new for them because people are repeating themselves if they are not more concentrated on the method and, you know, like development and steps in the method. And I, at least in Czech Republic, we are we are lacking those materials because uh, the the pedagogues are not motivated uh, to to write such uh, uh, methodological books. More they are pushed, or we are pushed to write um, some uh, reviewed uh, uh, like texts, or you know like text which can uh, be. Um, uh, somehow uh, uh, exchanged for the in academical world uh, for some uh, like credit but uh, 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 yeah yes. yes thank you I see maybe that, that was something that we we, uh, we we faced as a kind of complaint from the students uh, at least in at the Prague uh, Fine Arts Academy is this uh, certain gra gradation because it's a system of master school and uh, they enter the school and for six years, they still more or less with the same master or they can change the studio, but what, what they are lacking actually, and this is something that, uh, that they are lacking any, any kind of steps of development, right? We are not part of Bologna system, for example. So there is not even uh, after two years, there is no exam and suddenly uh, they are in six years process and there, there are no clear steps, how, how, where they go, how, how they should improve, what, what are the steps actually, where they develop for, what they go for. And this is a big lag that, that was brought by, by the students themselves. So I would be curious 
what, what would be your experience with, with this matter, whether there should be something like more formal uh, uh, definition of, of various stages of, of the studies? I think that uh, this um, uh, system we have is very like old fashioned, but on the other hand, uh, there are, uh, is plenty of really interesting things uh, because in the, uh, uh, let's say like more like Western schools, but not only, uh, the students are all the time like busy with collecting like uh, credits and, you know, like uh, combining subjects and changing them. and. Uh, you can easily kind of just like drift and, you know, um, uh, yeah, and you can spend the years just like jumping from uh, this uh, workshop with this artist to another. And when you are in contact with someone for six years, you can develop a like deep like understanding. And uh, sometimes you, you really know the student like, like very well. And it's uh, almost like, uh, uh, if you attend uh, like psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, uh, uh, that the relation is yeah is different, and uh, um, of course it can be very like um, uh, um, also um, like sick or like uh, because if the, there is someone playing this role of master, like this is like super problematic. But I think that if we use this old fashioned system and we are a uh, um, uh, little bit um, change, we, we reform it. So uh, the, the master is not the master anymore. Uh, then it's, it's great because we have this continuation of the six years. But uh, as you mentioned, then the new students are coming and the, uh, you know, and some discussions uh, and stuff like that is repeating and repeating and the, they uh, uh, the bored because there is no uh, such a thing as you know some some clear steps uh, and certain pedagogical methodology in it and uh, yeah i'm like trying to work on this uh, issue as well you know but it's it's difficult <laughs> but i'm happy that i can stay with with some group of people uh, for 6 years because i am using this open form method uh, by Oscar Hansen, and uh, you need uh, like months at least, uh, like going through this methodology. And uh, yeah, after one month or one year, uh, a few months or one year, uh, you are really like super connected in the group of people. And this group must be the, the group of the same people. It's like not for one workshop, you know, like you need to, yeah, uh, to work with certain group regularly. And I, I don't know if you know this method by Oscar Hansen. Oscar Hansen was an uh, uh, architect, like studied in uh, Le Corbusier studio, and uh, but Polish one. And then he moved back after the Second World War to, to Warsaw. And he uh, started uh, to uh, teach architecture, but then he switched and he came up with this idea of open form. So it was, um, so let's say the classical art uh, was observed as a closed form for him and he was a like socialist and for him it was more about not the products but creating some uh, like communities and interactions but the nice thing about this method is that it's not only um, nice words about uh, community and people working together etc but he precisely described or not only like uh, by himself but it, the, the method is described by the um, uh, followers or people who have been trained in it. So uh, there is methodology. It's not written yet, but you know, like uh, uh, there's at least like 20 levels of uh, this open form uh, like methodology and you can exactly like go from one to another. But it's hard to, to work on it and also to have a time and support and you know to to for example uh, turn it into a methodological book. So yeah, thank you. So maybe if you have if you have some comments to this kind of gradation of, of the studies, how do you deal with the with the temporality and with the kind of 
setting up the goals, if there should be even goals uh, in terms of time where, where the students should go. And this is the last question actually, because we are somehow uh, going over, over the time. So, uh, or please, if you have a kind of closing comment, uh, it's also a good, a good moment now. Um, I make a comment. Um, um, I don't know a lot of the different systems and um, uh, I think our different system will, will have some advantages and some disadvantages in, in terms of steps within the uh, studying time. Um, I can, um, what we try in the, in the team and with the students, what we try um, is to spend time with them. Yeah? So we, we meet once a week, uh, the whole day. We, the students start with cooking and we try to start um, a conversation. And this conversation takes one year or let's say five years. And, and um, uh, this is the thing somehow to, to, to stay in contact and to, to, uh, to, to um, exchange opinions and, and to take that serious. And um, I think the curriculum itself it can be very tough or not. Also, in, I think at the Angewandte, it's quite open. Yeah? There are still some historical steps like uh, first, uh, first part and second part, but I have the feeling, or actually I really don't know how, how uh, if the students are bothered by that, by that, but I have the impression they have time to work in the group, to work alone and, and, and uh, um, uh, they have time and they're interested to meet and that's the thing I, I, th I think. But in, is it enough to have, you know, like space and time? Like I think that that's not definitely like super important and that's maybe the first, you know, like uh, basic uh, uh, need for them. But uh, I think that, uh, that there is also another, uh, um, there are also, I think that we as the pedagogues uh, at the art schools, that we are kind of like obliged to uh, study the, 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 the pedagogical methodologies and also you know, like, uh, um, some, I feel that sometimes we just think that it's good that they are in contact with us and that they can, you know, like stay somewhere. It's a like warm place and they don't have a lot of lectures. But is it, but I, I don't think that it's enough, you know. Like I like um, I think that we should offer, and it's not that we should teach them how to make art or motivate them or you know like push them to do something. But but even this communication with them. Uh, should be somehow structured, you know, for example, S in the uh, therapy and structured also individually, but also, you know, like when we are talking uh, to them as a group, but um, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, so I think that it's just not enough to say it's nice that, in, uh, that the art school is this greenhouse that you can go and you can just, you know, like, uh, uh, be enlightened and uh, in shelter with where is no like wind, which is uh, no, and it's not enough. <laughs> I agree. Dear Svetlana, dear Olaf, do you have some uh, closing comment from your side? I, I was carefully listening to Pavel, what he was asking or uh, highlighting the necessity of having a kind of structure because the academy where I am in in Munich has a very similar um, situation. There is no master, there is no bachelor. You have this class system where people are in your class for quite a long time if you want or if they want. And I think it is absolutely needed that there is kind of structured uh, environment, but there's also something what I wanted to say, what for me was very important, how much I got as a teacher from the students. So how much I learned 
for myself because uh, there was this kind of necessity also to keep yourself open and you make also yourself and your position questioning. You have responsibility, but it doesn't mean that you have a better knowledge sometimes. So, and what I found for me important is to keep up curiosity and a field of curiosity and a field where people can engage with different things, but if they want to engage, then really give them the possibilities to go deep and to be precise and really to uh, learn what so much as possible you can learn and open up all these ways of so we do every year a long travel like for a week or two weeks together and we go to places where normally uh, people not go because they're not the art thing so we went to romania to georgia we also went to bohemia prague and all these kind of things where i found this important to understand that one of the most interesting things is to engage what is out there and then you go back into what somebody calls the greenhouse but you have a space where you can deal with these experiences in a unique way nobody is asking you immediately for purposes and that is a gift and it is something what needs to be cultivated and I see it, the need that people have to learn things and that after a process of being six years or five to seven years in an institution, what does it give them? It's an important question, but it's also maybe just to offer the ability to become somebody who is responsible or responsible for her or himself. And also to deal with this responsibility in a way which has a kind of solidarity with other people. That is something what I, I found is very abstract, but this is very important. And these places are shrinking. These places are not that many anymore. That's why I am very defending this old school model somehow and not so emphasizing to structure it more and to bring more the technical aspects into it in a curriculum which is precisely uh, giving all the decrees what you have at the end and to professionalize it because this is not what it is it is not a profession I really agree do agree with you but you know I think that uh, uh, like in, in the beginning of your comment you said that you are learning from the students it's true and great and I'm also learning from my students but the school is should be the center to the students and not to the teachers. So, you know, like as a teacher to say, thank you, my students, I was so much enriched by your young creativity, uh, you know, and you are not saying that, but, but, it's, but, it, but it's a dangerous that, you know, like it can, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, like turn uh, in the way that the school is there for the teachers um, and uh, with the privileged uh, of, you know, like kind of like empty space in this glass house or greenhouse. Uh, uh, yeah, like this is like super great that we have this like a uh, uh, little bit like slow with uh, uh, time uh, um, and, uh, you know, and space when the students are not pushed, but uh, usually are and often and more and more, uh, they are not pushed by their teachers, but uh, they are somehow pushed uh, to uh, to exhibit or to, you know, like uh, even like share uh, their art or what they are doing on the social networks, etc. Maybe you even don't know it, but they are like constantly, you know, kind of like pu like uh, pushed to it. Uh, so uh, I think, and that's also in this my uh, text, that the greenhouse uh, uh, is not a good metaphor anymore, that we could, we should more work on uh, the you know like to turn the studio into like deprivation chamber or like this totally or, or Faraday cage, which is like uh, even you know like um, uh, uh, like not transparent, not visible, uh, and uh, definitely uh, um, uh, like like somehow you know like disconnected from this frenetic uh, uh, um, uh, sharing culture. Because the students are not anymore sitting in the studios and uh, painting or whatever. They are, you know, sitting there and painting or doing other stuff. But as well, you know, all the time, you know, self-promoting that they are in the art school because they are pushed uh, somehow to be present uh, all the time. You know, so, so, yeah, but it's for uh, uh, another discussion. Sure. 
I mean, I think it's about an exchange and um, maybe uh, in Zurich, the situation, we are not a greenhouse, but I don't know if you know the building. It's a really big building. I think it's as big as 13 football fields. Um, so when we set some rules or structures like on a football field, of course, sometimes they are not very popular and not the students don't really, um, you know, uh, uh, care. Um, and we also kind of work sometimes against us as teachers because we teach them independence and resistance. <laughs> so they, of course, cannot always um, go with the rules and the structures we give um, to the students. Um, but um, yeah, I think also sometimes it's a bit dangerous to put yourself on the level of the students and kind of be their friend and whatever. Um, there has to be a certain kind of professionalism. I think also, as, as you mentioned, all it's a profession. It's not, um, um, yeah, it's, it's not just something, some kind of a, a spare time activity. Um, but of course, we treat the students when they get older almost like colleagues because we also appear in group exhibitions together. We also do activities together. We travel together. And then, of course, you also... Um, not the, the master teacher or the master professor, but you also become one of the, the members of the group. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, there, there were lots of interesting things. Also like what Pavel says that there are no books we have for the students. I never thought of it, but it's true. We don't, we don't have any books. <laughs> and it's interesting because it's a, it's a university, <laughs> but there are no books we give the students. They have to find the books themselves. So we have to give them recommendations and uh, so on. So there, there is no really like a real structure which maybe is good as well. And so maybe we should try to keep it. But on the other hand, yeah, sometimes you also wish for more kind of, um, yeah, advice. And, and the repetition, I also recognize that there had been also like an issue we have discussed that sometimes students say, yeah, the, the teacher don't kind of elaborate, like it doesn't go further than from the first year to the fifth year. Um, there's a lot of repetition. We, you know, talk about the same things. Um, the things are always related to the, to the teacher's practice or, um, yeah, so maybe sometimes it's good to have some kind of uh, education also for the professors, um, how to structure a course over a period of um, four, five, six years, yeah. Actually, you are leading to a good point. We were also discussing that the continuation of these talks could be something like a summer schools for, for professors, you know. That would be something nice to go outside and just share these, these uh, questions and uh, the, the, these uh, inquiries, actually, uh, on a kind of uh, summer school for, uh, for professors. So uh, actually, it's, it's, it's a closing moment, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Thank you very much for uh, attending this, this last session. I would like to thank very much uh, to all participants that took part. It was 19, 19 people in the, in the whole uh, process. And uh, of course, I would like to thank also very much to my colleagues that, that uh, helped to make this happen. Uh, uh, Tomáš Vaněk, uh, Dušan Záhoranský, Lucie Drdová, Viktor Takáč, Pavel Gašparín, all from AVU, and uh, thanks them for their support. And uh, I hope we will, we will continue. I hope, I, I'm sure that we will continue, whether at summer school or uh, otherwise. And also I would like to invite you, if you want to join this uh, afterwards meeting with, with other participants, uh, I send you a link into the into the chat. So thank you and uh, all the best. Thank you.